Okay, we've got uh, nearly 400 people uh, signed in at the moment, so we're going to make a start and others will join, no doubt. Um, so welcome to this BPHO event. It's um, uh, Dr. Andrew French talking about round one questions. Uh, it's actually the 2021 paper, if you've read the blurb on the uh, uh, BPHO website. So welcome to the first of these sessions. Uh, I, I must point out that Andy's uh, uh, spent a lot of time preparing these questions or these solutions. Um, and uh, if, if you are to gain something from it, it's not from really, uh, unfortunately, from his hard work. Uh, he provides the incentive. But if you want to really uh, get somewhere, you have to do the hard work yourself. Um, there's no avoiding it. Watching him uh, elegantly uh, flow through the solutions is wonderful, but it doesn't really improve your physics, I'm afraid. Um, you've got to have tried them yourself, got them on paper, not necessarily neatly written up or anything, but you've got to have worked through them. Otherwise, you won't appreciate what is going on in the solution. So he is there to sort of lead the fray and provide an incentive for you to actually have a go yourself or have a go with a friend. Go find a colleague who's interested in doing them, working together. It's uh, so much easier than uh, plowing through at home on your own. So welcome to tonight's session. Uh, I'm going to be going for 45 minutes. You can type um, questions in the Q and A, um, and if there are people, if there are over 500, then you'll be watching on a YouTube video. And there is a Google form that you can ask questions in. But I think most people uh, will be able to use the Q and A. Um, and this is not the sort of uh, kind of frivolous questions or hello, you know, it's nice to be here kind of thing. If you could focus on the questions that are being dealt with uh, during the session, that'd be super. And we will try and answer them. OK, thank you very much. Uh, we look forward to it. OK, thank you very much, Robin. Good evening, everybody. My name is Dr. Andrew French. I'm from Winchester and uh, it's fantastic. 419 people. That's brilliant for Thursday evening to see some physics. So um, before we begin, um, I was going to give you a few links. Um, so um, and this is your first session. You've never done this before. Welcome. Um, if you in the future you want to get some of the most out of these sessions, uh, this is what I recommend. So um, I'm just going to go and share my screen and um, hopefully uh, it will let me know if that's working. Is that working OK? Um, so uh, we have on the BFO website, um, if you go to bpho.org.uk, um, you would have got an email from from us. Um, if you could go down to um, competition dates and events and scroll down, there's for maximum impact, download a set of questions from here and print them out. So this will take you to my little website called the Eclecticon. There are many things on there for you. Uh, but this particular page is um, really fo focused on these seminars, which will be running from today, every Thursday until BPHO round one. And we'll take a little pause and then it'll be the computational physics challenge after Christmas. So um, what we've got are the uh, standard papers um, and did my solutions. But the question, the key ones for you people are the one question per page workbooks. So um, the gold standard, I think, is for you to print one of those out. It'll take you to a PDF, print it out, and then you could work, as, as, as Robin mentioned, you could work perhaps in pairs and you can be working through those questions as I go through them. Ideally, uh, have a go at some questions before the sessions and then you can annotate and update uh, your questions. You might discover you've got them all right, and that'd be fantastic. You might discover there's a different way of doing it or a more clear way of doing it. Um, or you might have got really stuck, and then you can uh, we can give you a few hints, and then you can have another go. So I think that in terms of physics problem solving, it's important that you have multiple goes at this kind of thing. Um, yeah, there will be a, uh, the round one. Um, it's just like an exam, I guess, uh, eventually. Um, but this is much a bigger, bigger idea that um, physics problem solving is about mathematical modeling and applying our skills to be useful. And that really is the kind of wider mission of BPHO. It's not just about selecting teams and giving away medals, although that's fantastic. It's about getting you people interested in physics and becoming very useful over time. So without further ado, um, let's get stuck in. I also want to note that we've got an extra um, beta page. Now, you might this might be a bit small, so you might want to sort of screenshot this or write it down. And it's https colon slash slash, but papers.bpho.org.uk. And that will give you a sort of, um, well, something similar to what we're going to use today. So in individual questions, but you can go for all the different years, etc. So if you want to have a play with this, um, uh, give us some feedback because uh, this is a beta version. But if you want to get the old school stuff, 
uh, i.e. just literally a page which you can print out, you can go to this website. OK, so there we are. I hope that's fun. And um, uh, let's let's get stuck in. So I've got my little page here. I'm going to uh, start with some momentum. So there we are. Hopefully this will be suitably momentous for you. Right. Um, so momentum questions are really good at sort of starting off. Uh, there's sort of it's more of a closed system and uh, and it will sort of demonstrate the sort of principles of conservation of momentum and conservation of energy that are fundamental to physics. So um, I'm going to start from the beginning. Some of you may be experienced problem solvers. Some of you may be really new. Um, so I'm going to try and pitch it uh, from a, a sort of from the beginning at the moment and we'll go from there. Obviously, if you've got any questions, put them in the Q&A and uh, we'll sort of find some pauses during this session to uh, to look at those. So here's a problem. All the problems in round one look a bit like this. Um, this is the first part. You'll get a word description. And what we need to do is go from this little story uh, to a diagram and then we can go into the land of physics. So what's going on? Well, firstly, you might want to label various things. So there we go. We've got have um, a railway truck traveling on a level track at five meters per second. So I'm going to call that U1. I'm going to give it a label. All right. I've got a truck of twice the mass. So let's call M the mass of my railway truck. And the other one has mass 2M. So I'm basically deconstructing my sentence into is going to be the, the velocity of the second one. It's going in the same direction. OK, so that's going to be important. And then they couple together and continue moving. So that's going to be uh, an inelastic collision. All right. They basically stick together. All right. So now we've got this whole thing set up. Let's draw a diagram. So for momentum problems, um, you may have different styles, but this is what I recommend. Basically, you're going to have a before and after. I'm just going to make my pen a little bit smaller. There we go. So what will happen is momentum system before they collide and then we've got the momentum of the system after. So what we want is before a diagram and then after of um, some railway carriages. And uh, so those of you who are artists, you could do a much better job. And it's worth taking a little bit of time in your diagram because it's going to help while you're doing this, your mind's beavering away and going, OK, what sort of physics do I know? What sort of patterns can I remember? Um, so it's really worth drawing a picture to start off with. All right. Before you get stuck into writing down algebra and even eventually writing down numbers. Oh, hello. Hope that was all right. OK, so uh, this is our before situation. And uh, we, are we still OK. Is that right? So I had a strange scream in the background there. All good. Yeah, I think we're OK. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. The transmissions are uh, glitching uh, just uh, very occasionally, but it seems fine. Fine. Carry okay, on. Fantastic. So I'm just going to I'm going to remind myself because this is a big screen what my uh, speeds are. They're all in a good unit. And what's going to happen after? Well, they're going to collide and stick together. So in my diagrams, I'm reminding myself with what the text says. So I'm doing this to make sure I don't miss anything. and I don't kind of, uh, you know, get sort of confused or distracted by something like that. OK, and there's my little coupling and they're going to move together. Here's my other carriage. There we go. So that's M and 2M. There we go. Now they're moving together. So what we want, the final speed of the combined truck. So let's give that a, a symbol and the percentage of the kinetic energy lost in a collision. Well, we'll do that a bit later. So there we go. So firstly, that's now a well set up problem before and after. And hopefully, um, you know, we can now relate this algebraically. They're all going in the same direction. This is positive. And we need a positive direction because we're talking about momentum, which is a vector quantity. All right. Some things might be projectiles that you might have uh, two dimensions. So we need a coordinate system. Right. So let's answer the first part. So by conservation of momentum. And do do write some words. Yeah, we don't have to write an essay, um, <laughs> but uh, um, it's going to remind you what principle we're doing. OK. And in this direction, that's positive. So we know what we're up to now. Now we can write down some numbers and some algebra. So M times U1 plus 2m times u2. That's the momentum before. And the momentum afterwards is going to be 3mv. Brilliant. 
Right. So um, given we know everything on the left hand side, uh, we can just divide by 3M uh, to give us our final answer. So M is going to cancel. So therefore, what do we got? We've got U1 plus U2 all over 3 equals V. And now I'm ready to stick some numbers in. So I can do lines of vertical line here to save a bit of space. So therefore, V is going to be 5.0. That's what our inputs are, plus 2.5 uh, divided by 3. And the answer is in meters per second. That's our unit. If you work that out, that gives you 3.3 meters per second. OK, if in, you know, as a fraction, that would be 10 over 3. But of course, that uh, requires infinite precision. So uh, there we are. However, that might be useful for later calculations. So uh, that's that's the sort of uh, fractional answer. OK, cool. So that's the first part. And now the second part is what is the percentage of the kinetic energy lost in the collision? So probably the nice way of looking at this is just to uh, start algebraic. That is going to be a theme with all of these things. Diagram, physical principle, generate some algebra and then rearrange if necessary and stick in the numbers as a kind of recipe <laughs> that's pretty much how all physics problems go okay uh, so let's work out the kinetic energy before so it's a half m i'm going to stay with algebra u1 squared plus a half 2m u2 squared and notice i'm not going to stick any numbers yet i'm going to keep it algebraic so i know that i've got all the terms all right because i don't know whether i need to rearrange anything yet now uh, there's going to be some energy lost Let's call that delta E, shall we? And then we've got the final kinetic energy. So we've actually got an expression of conservation of energy. OK, so this is the energy lost. In other words, that's not kinetic energy. It's sort of heat, etc. All right. So this is the kinetic energy before. And another nice thing you can do is just to sort of annotate what the bits mean. So kinetic energy after. All right. So it's really clear. So um, before we get stuck in, just to spend a bit of time to set things up. All we're doing is we're looking at expression of conservation of energy. Right. Now we can start to move into maths land. Right. Uh, so what we're trying to figure out is our, um, our sort of final kinetic energy. Maybe well, we can evaluate those separately. All right. And then we can sort of work those through. So what's going to be our initial kinetic energy? So our initial kinetic energy, because we know on a percentage, we want to take the difference. So if let's put that in. So it's going to be a half. So we've got M. We've got five squared. All right. Plus two, five over two squared. OK, um, so I'm going to use fractions here um, because, you know, we can do this sort of. Well, you could just put numbers, the calculated numbers. But I think it'd be better in this case to work out as a fraction and then round our final answer to I don't know, two significant figures, something like that. So if you put that together, um, so we can take out uh, 25 over 2 from here. Um, and then what we're left with is 1 plus a half. OK, so that gives you 75 M over 4. OK, that's all in joules, of course. All right. And what about the final kinetic energy? What's that going to be? Well, that's going to be a half M. We're going to add so we can factor out the M 1 plus 2 here. 10 over 3, that was what we calculated in the first part, uh, this one here. And I'm going to use that fraction because uh, you know, there's no need to sort of, uh, you know, perpetuate some errors. And if you put that, uh, if you work that through, that's 50 over 3M. Now, why have I done this? When well, you think about it, we've got M on both sides because it's a fraction that's going to divide. So then if we look at the delta E over the initial kinetic energy, that's what it asks us for. All right. Well, we've written down what it is. Now let's put the numbers in. So our delta E is going to be, well, 75 over 4. Oops. 75 over 4 minus 50 over 3. And they divide that by uh, 75 over 4. OK, so the M's will cancel for all of those things. And if you put that together, uh, I think sort of, well, if it's a, do that into a calculator. But if you like, I would do it probably like this. 4 over 75, and that turns out to be 1 ninth, which is about 11%. OK, so the energy lost as a fraction of the initial kinetic energy is about 11%. There we go. So as a recap, um, it's about a page of working um, if you space it out. Um, but we've got a diagram. 
right? And we define our universe. <laughs> all right, because physics land, all right, it's not really the real world. <laughs> okay, some of you uh, some of you think, what's, what's physics isn't reality? What's going on? So physics is an approximation of the real world. Um, I believe in reality. I hope you do too. Um, so we're saying, okay, what, what, what are the essential features of the real world that we care about? Um, can we make a mathematical model of that? which ignores the complicated stuff that is irrelevant, the second order or third order terms, uh, what's the essentials? And that's what we've created in our diagram. All the things we were talking about have to be defined in the diagram. And then we are applying the laws of physics algebraically, sticking the numbers and we've got an answer, okay? Don't forget to use a bit of English or your language of choice to um, uh, annotate the terms. I hope that was fun. So um, now, given this is a, uh, you've, you've come all this all this way to, to uh, spend your, your Thursday evenings, I want to do something that's a bit different. I'm going to depart uh, from the BFO paper uh, on, a, on a momentum and give you a classic momentum problem as a little extra uh, for coming tonight. So I'm going to create another little, um, uh, actually, I think I'll do this at the side here. OK, so some of you may have seen this uh, classic problem. Uh, and if you haven't, get yourself a basketball. Here's a basketball. And get yourself a tennis ball. Here's a tennis ball. I don't know if that yellow has, has actually uh, uh, sort of come out. So I'm going to put a little line around it. This is a basketball of mass big M. And let's have the tennis ball ball of mass little m. OK. Now, uh, if you want to put this into the Q&A, if I drop that system from some height, from rest, uh, let's call that uh, height little h, OK? And this is dropped in a gravitational field, strength g. What happens to the tennis ball? Uh, do you want to uh, kind of put into the Q&A? What, what, what does it do? It's quite spectacular, actually. I think, Ollie, you're going to have to uh, uh, give, give it a couple, of, a couple of seconds and see what comes out. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can still hear you. Yeah. So what do you think is going to happen next to the tennis ball? It really is quite spectacular. If you haven't done it, give it a go. <laughs> right, what's uh give me give me the sort of the top five, Ollie. Is he there? So yes, a few people are saying the tennis ball jumps higher than the basketball. Right. Now, a lot our, of people are saying very high. One person has given a a particular number of nine times. Oh, amazing! So yes, yeah, so this is the classic problem. So um, you won't get nine h, all right, for a tennis ball and a basketball, okay? Um, but in the limit where the basketball is infinitely more massive than the ball above, all right. So this is what's amazing. If m is much much bigger than little m, and all the collisions are elastic. In other words, there's no kinetic energy lost. Which is a pretty big if. <laughs> OK, then the final height. Here's my tennis ball. All right. Uh, here's the ground. This is the one we care about. Let's call that height big H. H tends to nine little h. OK. Now, you won't get nine. I, I do this in my lab every year to introduce um, my students to, to, to the wonderful world of physics. And I reckon we've got about a factor of four. Sometimes if I'm lucky, it hits the ceiling. So quite a spectacular problem. How do we do it? Well, um, this is a really good example of using just conservation of momentum um, and uh, but also drawing a sequence of diagrams. So these, these are the diagrams. So let's see if we can prove that. So what we do, the first one is going to be our starting point. Here we are. So here we are, we're dropping our balls from height h from rest. Okay, we want to just give the essential features. Okay, so little m, big m, and g is acting this way. Right, what happens next? Well, these are all going to fall together. So our ball, big one, will hit the ground. So that's m, big m, and it's acquired some velocity, which I'm going to call u. Now what happens? Well, in an instantaneous amount of time later, 
the big one's going to collide with the ground and we're going to assume elastic collision. So that means its velocity is just going to reverse. But of course, this one is coming at velocity u. OK, so both are going at velocity u. So what happens next? Well, um, that's going to the, 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 the big ball, the basketball is now going to collide with the tennis ball. All right. So uh, that will collide. And so that will now be moving at a slightly different speed for that U dash. And that one uh, we'll call that uh, V, I think. OK. And then eventually we don't really care about what happens next to the basketball. because That's not so impressive. The basketball that I know might be some height here. But we're interested in the apogee, the final height of our tennis ball. And so, in other words, where it reaches its maximum extent, we're going to call that height uh, big H. OK, and that's where it's uh, instantaneously at rest. OK, so this one will be moving. Um, I'll give it some velocity, but so we don't really care about it. We're not going to calculate that. We could, but we're not going to bother. All right, because it's the tennis ball we're interested in. So there are actually one, two, three, four, five diagrams that we're going to draw here. And that helps you sort of to, to work your way through the problem. So what do we do first? Well, let's look at our diagram. The first thing we could do is calculate what U is. All right, we can use that from well, lots of ways, but probably conservation of energy is a good one. So if we say, um, let's just look at the tennis ball. So you look at the tennis ball. Right, so what do we got? We've got a half mu squared equals mgh. So calculate uh, conservation of energy here. Brilliant. So we can cancel that and we can say that u squared is going to be 2gh. Brilliant. Right. Well, that's useful or might be useful later. Let's go and use this. So now we can look at the situation where we've got a momentum. So this one here, let's call that before. And this one here, let's call that after. Because if we know v, we can work out h. So let's go and write that down too. Let's use a different colour for this one. So if we could say that the tennis ball starts off at the after stage with a half mv squared amount of kinetic energy, that's going to turn into um, mg big H amount of GPE. All right. So therefore, v squared is going to be 2g big H. Right. Brilliant. So if we know v squared, we can find big H. Uh, so what we need to do is find v squared in terms of u squared. So that's so we haven't solved the problem yet, but we've got a kind of path to what that uh, problem, that sort of solution is going to be in terms of what we've written down carefully on our page. And that this is kind of the, the technique of, uh, of how to solve these problems. So we're now going to use the momentum paradigm um, or for before and after here. OK, so let's go and do it. So what have we got? So before. We don't need to redraw it because we've already got it now. So what do we got? We've got, so let's have a direction. So let's make this positive. All right, because that's what the V1 is going to be. Um, so uh, what we can do is uh, we can sort of say, actually, we do need that little U dash. So what we've got um, in the before situation, we've got big M U minus little M U because it's going the other way. And after, all right, conservation of momentum, we've got, I'm going to put my little M's and big M's here. Little M's and big M's. Right, we've got um, MV, and uh, let's assume that velocity is going U dashed is in this direction as well. So plus U dashed big M. Okay. All right, so that's interesting. So we've got uh, the right, the left hand side of the equation is something we can work out. All right, so M minus little M times U. Let's just factorize that. A good bit of math technique to uh, simplify things as we go. But the trouble is, we have U dash. Ah, how do we work this one out? So we need to know something about the fact that this is an elastic collision. So we've used the idea of an elastic collision between the basketball on the ground to go from here to here. So we're going to assume elastic collision of mass M of mass M, the big one. OK, let's just spell I. OK, and um, in terms of the other one, between before and after, we can also assume elastic collision. So um, if we want to do that, we can use the coefficient of restitution uh, to work that out. We could use conservation of energy, but that's a little bit slower than doing this. So if you've not met this before, the coefficient of restitution 
And if you want to rapidly type this in the Q&A, <laughs> I'll give you 10 seconds. What does that mean? What's the coefficient of restitution? Okay, Ollie, what's the, what's the top of the list? Uh, separation speed over approach speed. Excellent. So it's the speed of separation over the speed of approach. And it's just a really nice way, rather than talking about how, what fraction of kinetic energy you've got, uh, this is a, it's much less cumbersome because it's going to be a number. Well, in principle, it could be bigger than one if you have some explosives. All right. <laughs> I don't know if that's been a BFO problem yet, but, uh, um, you know, firing two sort of rockets against each other. But it's going to be between naught and one, typically. All right. So the range, if we call that C. So C will be between naught and one unless we have explosives. OK, it's unless explosions happen. I.e. we're using some internal energy to uh, increase our speed. So if it's an elastic collision, then those things are going to be the same. So for C equals one for an elastic collision. OK, so we can use that to generate an extra equation. So let's call this equation one here. And if we've got C equals one. That means the speed of separation, which is going to be, let's look at our diagram, V minus U dash divided by the speed of approach, which is going to be 2U. OK, so we've got equation 2 now, which means we can find U dash, substitute it into 1, and we should be able to find out what we want, which is V. So we're now in maths land. We've done our physics. So let's go and do a bit of maths. Hopefully not too much. So uh, 2U is going to be uh, v minus u dash. So therefore, let's put it around the other side. u dash is v minus 2u. OK, let's put things in boxes uh, to make sure we've got now got results. And then we're going to put in, so in equation 1, so now we've got m minus little m, u equals m times v. v is the thing we're interested in, plus u dash, which is v minus 2u. And that's multiplied by big M. OK, so that thing there was U dash. Brilliant. Right. So now we've got V in both parts, which makes this problem rather interesting. So let's keep going. So what we got, I want to make this a bit bigger. So M minus little m, U. Uh, and let's have all the U's and the M's on the right side. So that's going to be equal MV. We've got another uh, big MV. And then we've got minus 2MU here. Let's put everything on the other side. So what have we got? We've got now three big MU. So three M minus little m. This is where the three is coming up, which of course, if we square that, we get nine. So that should be uh, giving us a warm, fuzzy feeling that we're approaching a, approaching a nice answer here. And then what have we got? We've got V is M plus big M, the total mass. So if we, uh, if we keep going, finally, we've got, therefore, I'll do the therefore rather implies, We've got V is three big M minus little m over little m plus big M. And that's multiplied by U, the speed we've got before. So let's just, uh, we could work out the speed. But what we really want is H. So let's just remind ourselves of the red and the green bit. So we've got U squared is 2G little h and V squared is 2G big H. So therefore, if we divide those two together, or by each other, h over little h, OK? So we divide those two expressions. The two g's will cancel, and that's going to be v over u, all squared. So that's what we're interested in. We've now got an expression of v in terms of u. So therefore, let's change the color pen to, because it's all getting very impressive now. So h over little h is going to be 3m minus little m divided by little m plus big M. The use, of course, will cancel now because we're dividing it and we're squaring that. And that is our solution. So that's the general case uh, for our basketball and tennis ball. I, I think if you were an exercise, if you can get a mass balance and weigh a basketball on a tennis ball, 
Um, I'm afraid I don't have those numbers <laughs> to hand at the moment. It's probably something like 500 grams worth. No, that's a bit about 300 grams worth versus 50 grams, something like that. I don't know, but you can work it through. I reckon that might end up being about four or three and a half. However, if M is much, much bigger than little m, what we can do is we divide both sides by big M. We can say, therefore, big H over little h, okay, is equal to three minus the ratio between little m and big M over the uh, that ratio again, plus one. And that's a slightly nicer way of writing it, because if this ratio is true, then little m over big M tends to zero. So therefore, as that's happening, so if, if therefore if big M is much, much bigger than little m, so imagine like a kind of uh, ping pong ball on top of a huge Swiss ball, uh, super pumped up, um, we might get this thing to go a bit higher. Although the, the, the ping pong ball probably needs to be, maybe think of a power ball, maybe a tiny power ball on top of a huge Swiss ball. That'd be good. Therefore, H over big H, sorry, big H over little h tends towards, that will cancel, and we've got three squared, which is nine. There we go. So an absolute classic of a problem there. And uh, so a really good one to work through yourself, impress your friends and your teachers. Um, and that's the kind of thing that you might find in university interviews, et cetera. But it really puts everything together. The fact that we've done a really good sense of sequence of diagrams, we've got conservation of momentum, uh, we've got conservation of energy, all that sort of stuff. And you can either make this a nice experimental project as well by videoing it and that kind of stuff. OK, uh, do we have any questions in the Q&A before I move on to another problem? We'll go back to the paper now. Any questions, Ollie? No, I think none that need need answering. Long. Fantastic. Right. So, um, OK, so I think we'll sort of work through now um, uh, in terms of BFO round one. So we're looking at the first part of this, which are lots of quick fire questions. So if you've never done this before, um, they are all of this kind of ilk. Um, and although we've taken a lot of time to write this all out, the idea is that you, if you want, you want to, if you want to do really well at this and aspire for a gold medal, etc., you're going to have to do quite a bit of practice because you will be working, you know, much faster than uh, I'm talking through now. But the idea of the same sort of style of writing it out, but you'll just get quicker. So, uh, what do we do with this? So this is a, is a two marker, so we're not going to have to write too much on this one. So we've got this formula for the frequency of a drum skin. Interesting. Um, so it might be uh, useful to have this kind of paradigm where uh, this notation means find the units of. All right. So, uh, you know, in the, what we previously did, we, you know, we just used algebra and you're probably familiar with those kind of, uh, kind of setting equations equal to each other. Um, so for things like dimensions and units, um, we kind of need a mechanism for doing that. So. The square brackets idea is means what are the dimensions of a thing? So um, you might find in books um, M, L and T as our fundamental ones. You could have charge as well, but we'll stick with these. So that's mass, length and time. I, I personally quite like to use SI units. Um, some people's authors will use things like MLT, but I quite like uh, like using like kilograms meters and seconds that's what i'm going to do so that's our si units so let's have a look so firstly what are the units of rho well if we eyeball this we've got one minus rho squared now one has no units so therefore the dimensions of rho must be no dimensions it must be a pure number so the dimensions of rho given that's what our notions are are no units <laughs> OK, so it must be the case because root one minus row squared is also dimensionless. So that is no dimensions. Because one has no dimensions. Is dimensionless. OK, well, that's good. So there we are. That's the first part. Bit of a trick question that possibly, but uh, well, not really, because uh, that's not sort of good to note. Uh, right now we're looking at so what are the units of quantity a? So the first thing I'd probably want to do is rearrange this. So if I say a squared is 0.47 hv over f root one minus rho squared. So 
what are the dimensions of a squared? Because if we know the dimensions of a squared, we can find the dimensions of a. So let's have a look. The 0.47 has no dimensions. So we want the dimensions of h, v over f. Everything else has no dimensions at all. Right, so uh, what's h in this case? Well, h is, uh, is, is a length. Okay, so h is the thickness of the skin. All right, the sort of drum skin. And v is the speed of sound. Okay, so let's just put that in. So what do we got? We've got a length, which I'm going to call meters. Uh, we've got a speed, meters per second, ms to the minus one. And the it's frequency, so that's going to be per second. So like 50 hertz is 50 wiggles per second. So that's going to be s to the minus one. So if we have a look at that, what have we got? We've got meters squared, s to the minus one over s to the minus one. That can cancel. Oh, that's one. So the units of a squared are m squared. So therefore, the units of a are meters. OK, so it's our dimensions of length, i.e. length. OK, so that's a dimensional analysis is quite a nice thing to do. All right. Um, so um, perhaps next time we'll do an extension. We're looking at the uh, using dimensional analysis to work out the period of a pendulum, for example, without actually doing any dynamics at all. All right. OK, so. Um, so just yeah, yeah I, I think a few people are, are still slightly confused by why rho is dimensionless. So like sure, yeah, a bit more depth. Okay, no problem. So um, if you have a look, if you look at the actual, the original formula, let's just zoom in here. Okay, so we've got the square root of one minus rho squared. Okay, so what we've got is that. So let's just, let's 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 sort of do the sort of situation. Well, let's assume rho has some dimensions. Okay, what would that mean? So we've got something that I don't know might have dimensions of meters or, or time or length, but if we square it, we've got something with dimensions. So how can we have something with dimensions which we subtract from something with no dimensions? That wouldn't make any sense. All right. Um, so the things where we add things that we add up or subtract must be dimensionally consistent. We can't sort of the idea of I know adding a length to a charge or a speed to a time. That just doesn't make any sense. All right. We can multiply things, of course. And the result will be of a different number of dimensions. But we've got an addition uh, that must be have a consistent set of dimensions. There is a quantity arithmetic, if you like. So because one is dimensionless, therefore rho squared must be dimensionless, and therefore rho must be. Okay, hope that's all right. Um, okay, <laughs> so uh, let's have a look. Um, how are we do with time? We it is so well. So we let's do a nice problem. Right. Okay. So I think what we'll do is. Uh, Quest part C is a little bit more involved. So I think what we'll do is we'll do question or well, part C to start off with next week. And we'll do um, some quick ones, which are pretty cool. So I'm going to I'm going to park C. So it's a five marker. It's going to be a little harder than the others. Um, and D is a three marker. But it's a that's what I call a sort of paradigm question. It's sort of something which you think, well, how on earth do I do this? Um, so it, it's rather nice. And you, next time you're on a train, you can actually see this happen. So um, if you're on a train and it's it's rained hard light today, and as the train accelerates, you can notice what happens to the water on the windows. So let's go with what we did before. Let's draw a picture first. So here's my here's my window. OK, uh, that's my water on my train. And what's going to happen is my train is now going to accelerate. So we're in the train. Look at the window. And what we observe is this sort of angle. OK, I'm going to call that angle theta. That's interesting. And the acceleration is, well, A, the acceleration of the train. And we're told that is 0.84 metres per second squared. Right. So how on earth do we deal with this? So this is the kind of key idea. We are going to consider a tiny element of the fluid. There we go. There's my tiny element of the fluid. Of the fluid right at the surface and i'm going to call that mass m all right because we're probably going to do some newtonian mechanics so we need a mass so we can do mass times acceleration etc so this is the idea so this is the kind of leap of imagination if you like you might call this a trick but the idea is that the more experience you get these type of problems you can then use this idea for other things so if we do that what we're going to do, we're now going to apply Newton's second law to that little spot. OK, just like we look at, um, I know, something on a slope, something like that. So let's go and draw this, shall we? So here's our here's our water down here. 
we're zooming in and there is our little little mass little bit drops of the water right on the surface so what are the forces on this one well let's go and do them shall we we've got the weight of my droplet because gravity's acting on this we assume we're uh, on a level train <laughs> so mg is the force of gravity on this we're also got a contact force because our droplet is sitting on a body of water so it's, it's a bit like you're sitting on you're probably sitting up at the moment as a contact force on you preventing you sort of falling through your your seat um and the whole thing is accelerating all right so if we assume this is sort of a uh, you know relatively stationary at this point the whole thing is accelerating with acceleration a so that's my acceleration a and what about geometry well that angle there is theta that's what we're trying to figure out let's call that theta and this angle here is also theta right so we've got an object let's put a coordinate system in i think a natural one is like this okay so now we've drawn our diagram we're talking about our tiny little element of fluid so that that's uh, there we are and uh, what well, we can now apply newton's second law so so this isn't a momentum kind of problem it's not really an energy problem it's dynamics so we're going to apply newton's second law which uh, uh is mass times acceleration is vector sum of force. There is a song with this. If you're interested, I can give you a link at the end. So there we are. So what are we doing? In the x direction, this means parallel. It doesn't mean 11. It means parallel to. So in the x direction, we've got mass times acceleration. What's the vector sum of force? Well, the only thing we've got is our reaction force, so r sine theta, the projection of that force in that direction. What about in the y direction? Well, there's no mass times acceleration. We've got R cos theta upwards, and I can, if you're new to this, I can deconstruct this force. Here's R, and I can talk about that as being um, a bit of force in the x direction plus a force in the y direction. So that's R sine theta upwards and R cos theta that way. That's theta there. OK, a vector sum of force. I'm just breaking that down into the X and Y directions to make that helpful for me to work out. So what's it in my um, my Y direction? Well, we've got R uh, uh, cos theta upwards minus MG downwards. Now, this is looking very similar to sort of um, inclined planes and that kind of thing. So therefore, what we can do is now maths land. So therefore, what do we got? We've got from equation two. The contact force is the weight divided by cos theta. And therefore, we can plot that in, put that into equation one. OK, and we can say that MA is MG sine theta over cos theta, which hopefully you will know is tan theta. The masses cancel. So therefore, A is going to be G tan theta. So if we know A, we know G, we can work out theta is the inverse tan of a over g there we go how cool is that right so let's put some numbers in so theta is the inverse tan of now what was a it was 0.84 meters per second it's so 0.84 and let's be conventional and let's have g is 9.81 not like 10 as it happens to be in the math department where i teach um <laughs> it's a gravity anomaly of course my mathematicians and that turns out to be 4.9 degrees. There we go. Brilliant. Two, two significant figures. How cool is that as a problem? So there we go. I think we're about to get to the conclusion of our session. So um, a bit like in the Teletubbies, what have we learned? Or I think that's what's our recap, what's our take home. So firstly, don't be scared of BFO problems. They are fun and cool. Uh, they may seem baffling at the start, but get, be confident that you can find a way through these. What's going to be the key idea? Well, firstly, get yourself these, print these out. So I've done these on, 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 on my sort of OneNote system. I think it's even better to have them on paper. So the first thing you want to do is download those from our little link. Um, so uh, this one here, click on one page question per page, get your nice sheaf of paper, and then you can chip away at that. Um, don't be afraid to do them again. So you could use a photocopy and try it try for a few other goes. And then have a go at as many problems as you can, maybe between, you know, one and ten or something like that, <laughs> depending on how keen you are uh, before next time. And then we can update those uh, when uh, we go through them. And, you know, if you've made a you got to the end of the end of the problem and you've got the same answers, that will give you a great sense of achievement. If you haven't, um, see if you can figure out um, how you can improve it. Uh, maybe have another go and uh, talk through everything. You know, these some of these problems are beautiful. 
Um, so, you know, ask your teachers to do them on the board uh, or you can do it on the board even better uh, in front of your class and, uh, and teach other people. That's another good way of doing it. Um, so in terms of a couple of paradigms, we had our before and after. We defined everything in a diagram. Uh, we stayed algebraic as long as we can. A, it's beautiful and B, it's very precise. All right. Uh, we use conservation of energy, that kind of thing. Um, we looked at uh, things like uh, units, so brackets being find the units of. Um, and then lastly, we've got that sort of um, special problem like liquids. Are, uh, you know, so we're taking a small thing on the surface of a liquid. That's the trick. And then we can do the same kind of problem that we do with sort of like um you know a, a ball rolling down a slope or something like that so it has this it's this problem is like some a problem that we already know how to solve and as you get better at this sort of stuff uh, your tool set will increase um as you do more problems so just before i go a couple of little links um so the momentum one here's a here's a little sort of program which um i use so this is only the matlab environment you can do this with python if you like but there we go so we've got sort of five and 2.5 and we can sort of see our vectors coming here. And there is our energy loss. So you can work that out as a fraction. Um, you can have some fun by changing these parameters. So if I make that say, I know, three meters per second. There we go. That gives us three. That'd be a nice problem. <laughs> uh, you can change the numbers here too. There we go. All right. So sometimes it might be good to code a particular problem up and you can solve all the problems. And in fact, creating the code really gets to grips with it gets you to grips with um you know the whole system all right um i think that's pretty much it so thank you very much indeed well done do come back um ideally with um, some problems of your own and uh are there any more questions in the q a yes there are yeah. can you stay can you stay on this diagram yep um, so the diagram um a few students have asked why are those two angles theta the same so could you quickly just explain oh, yeah. what absolutely the same. so what so what i've done so I've, the first diagram is 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 the carriage right and i've zoomed in um to my little little bit and now this is sort of this is this is sort of geometry so what we've got if i can make a little picture here we've got a z angle here okay well there's a couple of ways you could do it so if we can think of the triangle down here that's a right angle so this one here is going to be 90 minus theta and therefore this angle here must be theta all right uh R is, per is perpendicular to the slope. So that angle there must be 90 minus theta. And therefore, <laughs> the next one must be theta too. So, uh, so um, you know, get used to sort of looking, looking at the geometry. You know, what, what is the same angle as what we're talking about? Because if we're resolving forces like we've got here, we do need angle theta, which is this one I'm just colouring in. Okay. So, um, okay, I hope that's all right. Any more questions? Um could you just explain what R is? Um, because you've used oh, yeah, R as sure. a symbol. So yeah. what is R no in that? All. No problem at all. So um, R is, um, is often a, a letter we use for the normal contact force. I, I don't like to use N for that because N is Newtons, right? And that can get very confusing. So when, you, um, when, when you're, you know, if you push down on a table, the table will push back at you with a force. And we call that the normal contact force. Uh, there might be some friction as well, though because it's a fluid, uh, there won't be any friction parallel to our surface, all right, because it's, it's a fluid. So the only force on it is from the water molecules underneath, and that will be perpendicular to the surface. So again, that's probably an extra thing we could look at. If we were actually on a slope, I know a ball on a slope, there would be a friction force going this way. In fact, I have a little diagram just to show you if, um, so I'll probably do one more problem. Um, but uh, if I load my uh, slope, Questions. So there we go. Let's just see if this loads. So when I'm teaching um, uh, forces on uh, on things, so this uh, the cat. No, this is Sybil the cat. Sadly, she's no longer with us. This is very sad indeed. But uh, she likes to slide down slopes in a basket. So this force is on my cat. We've got friction actually up, acting up the hill. We've got the weight of the puss. That's the that's the sort of uh, magenta one. We've got the normal contact force. So the contact force on a slope is a vector sum of what I've called F, the blue one, and the red one. If you've got no friction at all, all you've got is contact force. In this particular slightly strange situation, we've got a tow rope as well. <laughs> so, uh, so we can get rid of that by having no tow rope. Uh, so let's have the rope tension being zero. And there we go. All right. So in this particular case, if the vector sum of force is red plus blue plus magenta, 
giving us a mass times acceleration acting down the slope, which in this case is 9.43 newtons. OK, so there we are. Right. Cool. Um, I think we probably ought to stop now unless there's any burning questions that you can ask me. I think the main one that people are asking now is what to do before next time. Right. So this will be my top tip. OK, so um, don't think I've got to answer every single BFO question that's ever been. No, no, no. Don't do that. Um, so maybe set yourself a reasonable challenge. You know where you are. If you're a real experienced problem solver, perhaps you want to do maybe 10 problems for next time from the 2021 paper. That would be really good. But if you're brand new to this, um, maybe have a look. So you go onto this page. All right. Click on the one question per page workbook. And it's a PDF. There we go. And now ask someone who has a printer, maybe you do, to print this out. OK, and there's lots of questions, loads of them. All right. One per page. Um, and then maybe maybe sort of pick the, the easiest ones if you're new. Something you kind of like, you quite like, like have a go at them All right, in the space here. Um, if you think, you know what, that, that, that might be too much. Have a go at the ones we've just done today. See what you can remember. See if you can write it in your own words. And that will build your confidence. This is all about sort of step by step building your confidence um, and your physics skills. So, um, but yeah, do prepare. The, the, the more preparation you've done, I think the more you'll get out of these sessions. Uh, we'll, we'll stick to 2021 for at least a couple of weeks anyway. Um, so this is the this is the section to um, to really go for. Although, of course, we've got many years as well to go back. If you really get stuck, um, my solutions are, are here and kind of similar to what um, I've been talking about today. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, um, I'm going to sort of stop sharing my screen and uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, it's been a privilege. Um, there are a few housekeeping things that might be worthwhile. Um, question number one is, are you going to share your notes, um, what you've made today? Uh, uh, can you make those available? Yes or no? Um, well, I mean, the, 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 the I've, I've only really gone off piste a little bit with the, the ball bounce problem. Um, I think probably uh, it's possible, but um, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'll have to think about this. Um, but uh, what you can do is you can get all of this from my website uh, in a slightly nicer format. Um, so uh, I'll just quickly share my screen for those of you who are still here. Uh, that one. And we are going to put this recording up on YouTube. Yeah. So um, obviously the all the BFO paper solutions, you can just click on this link. It says AF Solutions. That's my name. Um, let's just hide that. But if you go to, say, physics, there's lots of stuff here. And if you go to um, notes, uh, we were talking about mechanics. So let's go to mechanics. Uh, and we're talking about momentum. So let's go to momentum. And you'll have this is what I call an eclecticon page. There's a bit of maths here. So I'm going to go and find cut just the chase. Here we go. So here is the problem that we've just done. Two balls dropped together. And that's the fourth page. So there's some more basics. Uh, well, there's anything like all the good momentum problems I could think of are all written out here. So there's rockets, uh, there's collisions in straight lines, uh, some easy problems here, um, and in fact, ball bouncing. And there's a really crazy problem, which is called the moonshot, where you have a stack of balls, you drop them, and the top one has to leave the atmosphere. If you get 26 balls, that could probably work. But the bottom ball is 33.6 million tons, so it's probably not going to work. Anyway, um, there we are. <laughs> so lots of stuff there. Let me just stop sharing again. Uh, stop sharing. There we go. OK. Um, I'll, I'll just answer a few more questions. Um, in terms of scores you need to get uh, to get into round two, um, it's depend on the paper. Some papers are easier, some papers are harder. We typically take the top sort of um, 50 to 100 odd to progress the certain round, subsequent round. So it depends on the particular year. So it's not immediately obvious which year you need to get what, what mark. OK, um, so that's something about marking. Yes, if you look onto YouTube and just type in British Physics Olympiad, you will find our um, uh, YouTube channel if you're looking for that. Uh, if that's not clear, we'll paste it into the chat. Um, Ollie, could you paste it into the chat, our YouTube page, if that's all right? Um, yeah. And then one question has been about different year groups. Um, whether you're in your year 12 or year 13, if you are ambitious, uh, do come along. We don't have any restrictions. You do not need to be in year 13 to be able to attend these particular uh, sessions. Okay, So even if you're in year 8, uh, if you are keen and you're driven, uh, 
good for you. Uh, there are certain topics which are obviously topics which are A-level. Some topics are in year 12, covered in year 12, e.g. mechanics, typically covered in year 12. Things which are, might be covered in year 13, such as capacitance. Um, these are obviously things which are going to be harder. Um, you would just have to sort of either wait or be patient. Um, thank you, everyone, um, for attending. Um, I think, yes, thank you, Ollie, for typing in the chat. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. French. Uh, we'll, we'll pause for this evening and we will reconvene next Thursday, same time. Thank you very much.